welcome back to the undeserved flavor. Today I just wanted to have a candid conversation. The question surrounding universal salvation and what happens to not just sinners, but really bad people. Or to be more clear, what about justice or how is justice served? What if somebody commits atrocities, never repents, never shows remorse, never seeks any kind of reconciliation or restoration, goes to their grave with a smile on their face. What happens after they die? So let's say I'm an innocent victim of an atrocity, something absolutely gruesome. And I've devoted my life to seeking and following righteousness, God, whatever pre-qualifications there are to go to heaven when I die. Despite the trauma and despite the urge to act out, say, F you to the world, F you to God, and I have Grit, I've just gritted my teeth and did my best to live a good life, be peaceable amongst those around me, and try to live right in the eyes of God. And then I die, and I meet my The person that committed whatever gruesome atrocity that was committed to me on the other side. Now remember, I tried to forgive. I tried to either release or bury the guilt that I carried, the anger, whatever. I tried dealing with it. I tried all the self-help programs. I tried praying. I tried asking for forgiveness myself. I forgave the other person to the extent that I was capable of, but that other person absolutely and completely did not give two hoots about me, what they did to me, or the state of their soul and they went to the grave with a smile on their face not giving a flying damn about anything whether or not they believed in God or a God or some kind of an afterlife is irrelevant they could have cared less couldn't have cared less so what happens in context or in light of this universal salvation if in fact this is the truth? God came to earth, sent his son, however you want to frame it, announced good tidings to all, good will to all, introduced us to our Father, made his best, best effort at displaying other-centered, self-giving love toward all, extended forgiveness to all, took upon the sins of all to himself. So, he saved the world. All are saved. Everybody dies and goes to heaven. The end. 
What about justice? What about those people that you haven't been been able to forgive, that you still harbor resentment toward justifiably? It's not even your fault. You don't have a choice in the matter. You were victimized. You were assaulted in, in whatever way, big or small. You were a victim. You were victimized. You were hurt. You were damaged. You were broken. You were stolen from. Where is justice? Well, since the dawn of time, it seems people have tried to figure this out and try to rationalize right and wrong and Ultimately, our human rationale makes its way into our religion. Frankly, whether we're religious or not, if we're completely agnostic and have no idea or no interest in caring about what comes next, we still feel like justice needs to be served. I was victimized. I don't want to go to the other side. I don't care if it's bliss. If I have to stare my perpetrator in the face, in those evil eyes, and feel the shame and the pain of what happened, and sit there for all eternity knowing that person and myself are now stuck in the same world for all of eternity. And they're going to live it up in joy, utter bliss. And I'm supposed to enjoy bliss as well, but here I am with that memory, that life that I had that was absolutely and completely destroyed, decimated, ripped apart, stolen from me. And I have to be here with that devil of a person, that demon of a person. I'm not going to have a very good opinion of the character and nature of my father, God. Apparently, he really doesn't care too much about how I feel, how I was victimized, the pain that I endured for all of that time, the suffering that I went through, the intrusive thoughts that I had to live with for so long. Well, here's the thing. Humanity is broken. Everybody is broken. There isn't a non-broken person on the planet. We are all broken to varying degrees, and it goes all the way back to Adam, or to the beginning, wherever and whenever that was. People are broken. And you know what they say? Hurt people hurt people. It's absolutely not an excuse. There is no justification in saying the person that hurt you was themselves broken, were themselves broken. Um, it doesn't justify, uh, one, one wrong, two wrongs doesn't make a right. You know, uh, maybe that's not the right phraseology or whatever the term I'm looking for. Um, 
Just because that person was broken doesn't mean they should get off scot-free because they knew what they were doing. They knew full well what they were doing. They took pleasure in what they were doing. And here I am, the damaged goods, and there they are, not even remembering what they did. Maybe they were high, drunk, or maybe they just didn't care and it meant nothing to them and they've moved on. Well, this may be a red pill, blue pill scenario here because if you're gonna have you have to be willing to go down the rabbit hole if you want to understand how, how this works, how forgiveness works, how reconciliation and restoration works outside of this three-dimensional realm because you can't understand it in human terms. We can't, so it, this side of eternity, we have a justice system in most cultures. Well, virtually every culture has some form of a justice system, whether it's an eye for an eye and a tooth for a tooth, or it's a court of law like here in the States, or it's some tribal system of punishment. You know, what every culture in the planet, as far back as you can, I mean, even down to Simple retribution or simple revenge, you know, so-and-so in your family did such and such to so-and-so in my family, and I'm going to pay you back. Pay you back. We're going to gather up our kinsmen and return the favor. There's justice. We have human justice. A payment needs to be made. But do you, do you notice something about revenge? Does it ever work? Does it ever end there? It's kind of a lose-lose, isn't it? So let's say um, the neighbor kid came over and killed your dog. He's a mean little shit. He came over and shot your dog with his 22 rifle. He laughed, he watched, your kids watched, and he ran off, ran into his house, and took cover in his house. You went, banged on his door, his parents came to the door, you told them what happened, and the parents slammed the door in your face. They don't give a crap. For whatever reason, they slammed the door in your face. Maybe they're, maybe they're just, just overwhelmed with how crappy of a kid they have or maybe they literally just don't even care maybe they're proud of their kid for being a menace to society who knows it's irrelevant so you walk back to your house tail between your legs or maybe fists clenched steaming you go back inside, make a few phone calls to your brothers, cousins, friends, whatever. Or maybe you're doing it all inside your own head. You're gonna just do it yourself. You're gonna get back at them. They have a dog. Maybe they have two dogs. Maybe they have a cat, I don't know. Or um, maybe they don't have a pet. Maybe you're gonna get back at the kid. So you come up with some scheme, it's pretty uh, sadistic, I mean you're not going to kill a person, you know, you're not a bad person, but you're going to come up with something that's, that's going to definitely get back at them. 
you set your trap, it works. You cause some form of mayhem or tragedy or loss to your neighbor. They know who did it. They may or may not know why you did it. Maybe they know you were trying to pay them back and they don't care. All they care about is the fact that you just did this to them. Or maybe they actually don't know why you did it because what you did just eclipsed whatever it was they did to you. Well, guess what? Guess who's now planning the next attack? A week later, you wake up at three in the morning, your house is on fire, you get up, you're barely awake, coughing, you run, you try to run room to room, you can't get to every room, you try to get everybody out of the house that you can without dying yourself, you get out of the house, you try to take a head count of your family members, spouse, kids. You're missing one or two of them. You make an attempt to dash back inside where you're met with a wall of fire and you have absolutely no means of getting back inside. You don't know if they've made it out or if they burned in their sleep. You get back outside, collapse in the grass, fire crew, paramedics arrive on scene, throw you in the back of an ambulance. The next thing you know is you wake up after having been in a, in a medically induced coma for six weeks. When you wake up, you are faced with the news that your spouse and two of your three children did not survive. They were burned to crisp. Tell me, was it worth taking matters into your own hands? And now that you have even less to live for, are you going to continue to take matters into your own hands? Now, in this hypothetical scenario, you have one surviving family member and they are in a coma and they're probably not going to come out of it. They're brain dead from smoke inhalation and were burned over 90% of their body and they're probably not going to make it. They've been in a coma for over a month. There's no brain activity and you're the only one left. You've now made a full recovery. Your neighbor's still living there. Your house is a pile of rubble. Your insurance only wants to cover two thirds of it or maybe less. Maybe they don't want to cover it because they found out it was arson and there's going to be uh, a court battle in order to even get them to, to cover it. And the bank wants to foreclose because they see there was arson involved or maybe whatever. I don't know if the bank would want to do that, but I'm just hypothetically like your, your cards, your, your house of cards is, is collapsing. You're losing everything. You lost your family. You lost your house. Maybe now you're disabled. You can't go back to work. You've made a full recovery, but you know, let's say you have injuries that are going to bother you for the rest of your life, not to mention the PTSD. You've lost your job because you've been gone for so long. Where are you going to go next? You going to go back to your neighbor's house? You going to go get revenge? What I'm saying here is.
That is the same blindness that we apply to a religious idea of vengeance, retribution, revenge. And it's not God's ways. It isn't God's ways. Jesus came to display that. He said he could call down armies of angels on his behalf. But he didn't. And he could have, if in fact he is God and he is the creator of the universe. He could have come down and literally just vaporized his enemies. He could have handled it in a moment, but he didn't. Maybe it'd be a good idea to ask why he didn't. Um, I mean, that is a pretty common question. Why wouldn't he? Why didn't he? I mean, look at the suffering. Why is he letting us sit here and suffer? And, and, and suffer? Why are we just, we're supposed to believe in him and just suffer? And then we look on our neighbors and, oh, they're perfectly fine. Life goes on. They still have a house. They still have all their family members. They've moved on. And now they have new neighbors. There's a house going up over there. And they've made friends with their new neighbors. And you're no longer in the picture. What? Where is God in this? Where's justice? Where's the gospel? Now, you could draw up a million different analogies that fit this, the point that I'm trying to make. Like, what if you were born into a really broken family? Maybe you were born in poverty. Maybe you were born in a broken family unit where it was, maybe you were orphaned. <laughs> maybe you were born into a family and you were just abused by your own family. And you became an adult and it never changed. And the animosity from your family toward you just never improved. They've hated you from the day you were born. I mean, clearly that's not normal, right? Like, how could human beings be so mean? or so stupid, I mean idiotic, like can't they see what they're doing? I mean, it doesn't make any sense. So, and these people just don't even give a damn. So you're telling me we're all gonna end up in the same place when we die, just living it up, it's all gonna be bliss. <clears throat> yeah. And you know what? You're going you're gonna to understand that we're not taking all of this with us when we go there. There's a lot we have to learn about this life. I think one of the biggest things we can learn about this life is this existence on, in this plane is like a millisecond in terms of eternity. It's like that in terms of our eternal existence. Um, doesn't seem like that now, but I don't claim to have it all figured out, but I can tell you once you have a glimpse of the understanding that you're going to I don't even know the right way to say it. Once you die, see, death is like, you don't die. Once you <coughs> transition, once your consciousness, your essence, your persona, once you 
leave the vehicle of the meat sack that you're driving. Once you step out of that, once you transition, once you die, you do not lose consciousness. In fact, your consciousness expands to everything and everywhere. And once you are outside of this three-dimensional plane of existence, this, let me draw an analogy here. So imagine if you, imagine you are a cell or an atom or an electron or a neutron or you're a molecule, whatever. Let's just say you are, you're a molecule. You, your existence is inside a blood vessel or, a, or bone tissue in the big toe of a person. You are fully conscious. You don't know anything different. Your entire reality and, and schema and view is from the perspective of being a molecule inside of Let's say your bone marrow inside of the big toe of a person. You don't have eyes and ears and a nose and all this stuff of, a, of an entire person. But your consciousness is limited to that aspect of reality. That very limited perspective. Now, let's say you are an entire eyeball of a person. You have vision. Your eyeball can see whatever, you know, 45 degrees, whatever the, the view of an eyeball is of a person. That is your perspective of reality. You're going to have a different perspective of reality if you are an eyeball of a person or if you are a molecule of bone marrow in a big toe of a person. Okay? your perspective is going to be very different. You're going to be able to see different things. Now, if you are in both scenarios, a part of the same person, if you're both standing on an island somewhere in Bermuda, experiencing the ocean breeze, sunshine, the waves, you're both going to have a perception of what is going on. You're both going to describe what is going on very differently. Where am I going with this? When we transition from this plane of existence to eternity, when I say eternity, I don't mean a measurement of time. I mean an existence where all things in all times exist simultaneously. It is not something we can comprehend in this plane. It is something that you, you can only understand it when you get there and you see it. I mean, you can meditate, you can whatever, you know. I feel like I have glimpsed it, which is why I can speak on it. I definitely don't understand it completely, but I definitely know I understand it better now than I did a few years ago. Certainly more than I did many years ago. The perspective, see that's, that's the key word in this video, perspective. Vista, your view the place from which you see things, that is where you, that is where your reality is built. That is, 
Your perspective of reality is not reality. Is not all of reality. The perspective of a molecule of bone marrow and a big toe of a person is not the reality for all things that exist. Neither is one eyeball, eyeball's view of a person. But when you die, when, you, when your consciousness leaves this body, you are still you, but you are one with everything and everyone. You share all knowingness, all understanding. You, see, you can see from everywhere to everywhere. I don't know if you can do that all at once, but you can be there at once, if you know what I mean. You can be there at, a th at, at, at the speed of thought. You, can, you understand everything at the speed of thought. There are no remaining questions, because before you can even conjure a question, the understanding is there. Now, the Bible says, and don't quote me, because I'm doing this off the cuff, I said this was going to be a candid conversation. There will be no sinners, drunkards, adulterers in heaven. They shall not inherit the kingdom of heaven. Murderers, you know, all of the things, all of the bad things. Do you know how God destroys his enemies? Remember, his ways are higher than our ways. He destroys his enemies by making friends. If the person is a drunkard or a murderer, and they enter heaven, because you know universal salvation, well, when they enter heaven, that aspect of their per persona, reputation, identity, doesn't exist anymore. And check this out. The victim, when they enter heaven, they're no longer a victim. That aspect of their identity doesn't exist anymore. Now, I'm not saying those aspects of their identity are trivial. And I'm not saying that they can't be revisited or reviewed. Um, but they're no longer attached to you as your identity anymore. They're no, no, they're no longer a part of what shapes your perception of reality. It is something now, it's almost like you, you can look down at a textbook of, some, of a something that happened to someone else. I don't know if I'm, I'm trying to draw an analogy here. You're going to be so far removed from the illusion of being separated from God, we're now living in an illusion that we are separated from God. And because of that, we live accordingly. We do things that are not in accordance with our true nature. Number one, we are self-centered. We are self-focused. You wake up in the morning and you think about yourself. I don't care who you are. You may throw in a little, you know, I got to feed my kids. So you're thinking about your kids or I got to think about, you know, all oh, those orphans that I help, you know, and the orphanage that I care for or, you, you, or my spouse. But ultimately, when you're hungry, your mind is on you. We're 
blind to reality. We're blind to the reality that our true nature is other-centered and self-giving. Jesus displayed that on the cross. He said, I am in my Father, my Father is in me, and we are in you. And on that day you will know. Our true identity is other-centered, self-giving, charity, love, kindness. Also, we are not limited to the three-dimensional circumstances that we perceive to be limited by. Jesus multiplied food for thousands of people out of literally nothing. Jesus turned water into wine. Jesus raised people from the dead. He brought their consciousness back into their dead body. Jesus healed people in completely impossible ways, like restored sight to the blind or brought sight to the blind who had never seen in their life. He understood who he was as a living being. And he tried telling us that is who we are as well. We are as he was. Go ahead and find a scripture verse if you need a Bible to back this up because it's in there. As he was, so we are on this earth or something like that. Find it. It's in there. I'm not making BS up, okay? If you're a biblio idolater and you absolutely need the Bible to be the final authority and every little thing that you venture into believing, fine, go ahead and do that. It's in there. I'm not just making crap up. Everything I'm saying here, you can back it up in the Bible. I'm just having a con candid conversation. So, to the point of this conversation, which is, if universal salvation is the thing, then where is justice? What happens to sinners or bad people? You know, like, are we just going to make an excuse for them? Or are we just going to let them get off scot-free? Well, here's the thing. You've done some things in your life you're not proud of, and maybe you've rationalized them to the point where you think, well, it wasn't that bad, or nobody was hurt in the process. It's not about transgressing against God. God doesn't have an issue with forgiveness. He doesn't have forgiveness issues. So I'm not talking about disobeying the Ten Commandments and transgressing the Lord. I'm talking about things where you, you know, like the butterfly effect of your actions may have potentially actually not been so nice to someone else at some point. And you've rationalized them and justified them for yourself. The, the ends justify the means, right? Well, you don't know what you don't know. And there's a, there's a chance that somebody you've come across in your life lives to this day struggling with something you did to them. And you have no idea. Maybe their life is absolute crap mentally, like they struggle because something you, maybe you didn't even do it intentionally. Maybe you did it absolutely, maybe you were trying to compliment them and underhandedly triggered something and now their life is just an absolute mess. And it's your fault. And you have no idea. We're all broken. Nobody's perfect. And because we are selfish, and you are too, we have a tendency to screw up other people's lives to one degree or another. And now every one of us on the other side could 
find somebody to blame for some hardship or pain or suffering that we had in this life. What are we going to do when we get there? We're all going to put our fist up and demand justice. Or maybe some of us are going to, you know, take the humbler road. And just, no, I will forgive. But I can't. It's hard. I can't. I need help forgiving. And some of us, maybe we're just, it's easier for us to just take it in stride. Water off a duck's back. I could care less. I know that person is a piece of crap. I don't care what they did to me. I know who I am. And I can keep on walking. Who cares about justice? No, let them, let them go. You know, eat forgiveness is easy. Let, you know, however. <clears throat> but what about those people that absolutely did not repent or seek reconciliation? Or the people that just continue to this day, maybe just making your life a living hell? Or maybe they're not even that bad of a person and they just refuse to try and restore your relationship. Or maybe you feel like it's their duty to come to you to try and fix things because maybe they're the one that caused the problems. And who knows? I don't know. You name the situation. Well, here's the thing. On the other side, we're all one. We're all going to understand. Now, if you can understand on this side of things, everybody's broken. Everybody was hurt. Everybody's damaged. Mental illness is a big deal. And if someone is able to kill somebody else, they have a mental illness. They are a damaged person. They are basically no different than somebody who's born without an eyeball or born without a leg. They weren't born perfect in terms of what we think perfect should be. They were born with an ailment or they were born with a deformity. There are, there are a lot of mental illnesses and there are a lot of deformities. We're born with them all the time. Ultimately, we're all born and I mean, some of us are born absolutely perfect and then born into the perfect family and everything looks to be perfect. But all of a sudden, something happens and then you get your imperfections. It doesn't matter where the imperfections come from. If you're not born with an imperfection, you're going to find one. Because you live in the world we live in. We share this place. <clears throat> Everything's perfect. And all of a sudden, oh, no, now you got leukemia at age 17. What happened to perfection? And where's God letting it happen? Here's the thing. We don't have it all figured out. And at the end of the day, here's my perspective on all this. Once we're on the other side, the lake of fire, the Bible talks about, that, from what I have gathered, from all the near-death experiences that I have listened to, from the Bible, from learning the history of the Bible, learning the culture of those who wrote the Bible, read the Bible, those who the Bible was written to, preached it in the first few hundred years, all of the things that I have read, from what I have gathered, the lake of fire and the purification or the purgation or the punishment of God is literally a metaphor. It is, get it, literally, a metaphor it's literally not literal it's actually a metaphor for the flick of the light switch that takes place when you leave this body the lake of fire is purifactory it's purg purgation it's purgatory not purgatory 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 is not a place purgatory is not a period of time outside of this body time is not a thing Once the light switch is flicked, understanding of all things hits you like a ton of bricks. And all illusion, all lies, all misunderstanding, 
is burned up. As fast as darkness leaves the room when a light switch is flicked on. That's the lake of fire. The love of God is so intense, we, we're not capable of experiencing it in this plane of existence. I, if I had to theorize, I would say we did pre-exist. I'm not going to get into reincarnation because I don't know where I sit with that, but that's something that would, that's where the conversation would probably end up leading if we, if we go any further on what I'm about to say, just because it's the nature of this topic. I think we pre-existed. We are children of God, and if we are children of something that is eternal, we have the same Ness. Like an apple tree bears apples. It doesn't bear half apples. Apple trees bear apples and they bear apple trees and they bear apple trees and they bear. They, you don't. You, a child of a father is not half of its father, it is all of its father's nature and likeness. It's 100% unless God screwed up, unless we're not his actual children, unless, well, I mean, we're talking in biblical terms here, so if the Bible is not your thing, you know, you can use, you could easily say, well, we're not God's children. We're a, we're a spark of the cosmos or the, a spark of the universe or whatever. Well, that's a different conversation. And I guess this whole thing doesn't matter. Where I'm going with this doesn't matter to you. In terms of Christianity and universal salvation, we are children of God. And I believe we pre-existed. I don't know what that looked like. I don't know how... I don't know what it looked like. I don't know if we had pre... I don't know if we had more than like past lives. I don't know. But looking at this life that we're living right now, Understanding how universal salvation is going to work and reconciliation is going to work after this life and restoration. How does God restore seemingly irreconcilable and irreparable relationships? There has to be something bigger than what's on this earth. Understanding that doesn't exist here will exist and does exist there. I think we came to this plane of existence simply to experience something we could not experience in that plane of existence. Simple as that. I think, um, now why am I saying this? I'm saying I think a lot. Um, I don't just think this because I, I just conjured it up myself because I have gaps to fill and I don't feel like asking questions. Um, I actually, of the who knows what number of near-death experiences I've listened to. I've listened to a lot. I'm not bragging. I'm just saying I have gathered... Oh, I mean, I've, I've formed an opinion based on a lot of time invested in listening to experiencers. I didn't just hear somebody talk on a video like this one time draw a conclusion, and now I'm preaching at somebody. No, I'm just telling you what I've concluded based on what I've heard. But what I've heard wasn't as simple as I just heard it a few minutes ago. It was literally over a period of years and a period of years of weighing a variety of details and things that weren't exactly the same. Think like these experiences are not all the same. They are very unique, but there are definitely some trend lines and there are definitely some similarities. And so what I'm, what I'm getting to here is I think we will be restored on the other side. We'll be reconciled on the other side. We'll, we'll have a full understanding of 
Like you have, you're the victim and you have perpetrator. You meet on the other side. It, it'll be so easy. There, I mean, maybe there'll be tears, but you'll be able to hug it out. There'll be forgiveness. There'll be apologies on both sides. You know, for apology on your side for a lack of understanding and apology on their side for a lack of empathy and kindness and like just blindness. You know what I mean? Like, but I've heard, I've heard that we have like contractual agreements with each, with each other before we come into this plane of existence to cross paths and affect each other's lives in certain ways, good, bad, or otherwise. I mean, it's a stretch, it's a long shot, it's, there's, it's absolutely anecdotal, you know, it, there's absolutely no way of proving any of this, but honestly, if you can meditate on this and think, oh, okay, yeah, so everybody that I've loved that isn't here anymore is back in complete bliss. I can have hope that everybody that I've loved is waiting for me on the other side in complete bliss. And the people that have transgressed against me are simply like blind and injured dogs and they don't even know who they are. They don't even know that they're God's beloved children and they're absolutely broken shards of who they really are. Like, yeah, what they did was absolutely wrong. But if they knew who they were, and if they were in their right mind, there's no way they would have done that. And if they ever come to, before they die, they'll absolutely try and apologize and reconcile even if it's irre irreconcilable. You know, I don't know how much farther I can drive this. The people who you hate because of what they did to you are broken people. They're no less broken than you are and they're no more broken than you are. So, have a bit of compassion, have patience, and be at peace because it all works out in the end. It all, it doesn't just work out, it's being, everything is being fashioned for our good. We're experiencing something that is going, no matter how sick and twisted it is on this planet. Like there's, you could point, you could literally stop me in my conversation right now and say like, well, what about this and this and this? Because that's absolutely just disgusting. You know, people are being burned alive in cages or there's slaves, slavery still going on here and there. There's sex trade and this and that. Yeah, but you know what? We're not granted access to the understanding necessary to, to see how it all works out in the end. What we're given is access, direct access to the one who has the understanding. You actually have access to the one who has understanding. You have access to the one who can give you peace that passes understanding. Usually the ones who suffer most are the onlookers. Not always. And what I'm saying is absolutely speculation but from my experience I've been through some things and I can tell you from my experience usually the person that is going through the hardship is actually not suffering as much as the onlookers some of the onlookers 
may be suffering either in that moment or for the moments and years to follow. You know what I'm saying? Somebody had a hard thing happen to them. Maybe they got sick, struggled, it was nasty, cancer, whatever, suffered through it for three months or three years or whatever, and they just absolutely, like, just life just sucked. And then they died. And here you are, left with the intrusive thoughts about how much they must have suffered, and they, those thoughts just won't leave you alone. Who's suffering more? Who knows if that person had some supernatural relationship with God that you were not aware of, some peace that even in those moments of extreme suffering and pain, they were able to take a breath and relax and be in another place. Because that's really common, actually. God stepping in in those moments, like Stephen when he was being stoned in the book of Acts. I can tell you that I've been through some things that probably affected people around me more, you know, painfully than they affected me, you know. I, I don't know. I'm trying to think of an example, but don't need to go there. So all I'm saying is, if you're having a hard time wondering about, like, justice, our ways are not God's ways, and that's not a cop-out, it's an explanation. It's not an excuse, it's, it's, the, it's the fact that you just don't understand that your puny, teeny, tiny little tunnel vision perspective of reality just isn't there yet, and it's okay. I'm not talking down to you, I was there, it's fine. But that said, you can have hope. There is hope that your experience of reality will broaden. You will understand something that is, I mean, and when you understand it, you will understand that it would have been impossible for you to understand it prior to the time you gained that understanding. And it will be unfathomably jaw-dropping. It's like, the term epiphany is only scratching the, the surface. And you can't get your own epiphanies. Your epiphanies come to you. Epiphanies happen to you. Metanoia happens to you. Repentance happens to you. You don't repent. You don't attain your own epiphany. It is something that happens to you. Call it a gift. It is not something in your control. I can tell you that based on experience. And if you're still alive, like myself, you haven't had a 100% universal epiphany, so you don't know everything. I don't know everything, but you can seek, and you can find, and you can grow, and you can expand your understanding, which will help you to be at peace with yourself, with everybody around you, with this world, with all the suffering in the world. You can have peace. That is what Jesus came to this world trying to grab us by our shoulders and shook us and said, you, you can, like, the prison cell is locked from the inside. You can unlock the door and walk out now. Take off the blindfold, step outside, come to me. It's okay. Okay, so. Don't know who this was for tonight, but uh, thanks for hanging out. 
Um, his ways are higher than our ways, and that's not a cop-out. It is not an excuse. It's an explanation, and it's a, it's a fact. When you get the epiphany, when you either have a near-death experience, and legit near-death near experience, like a death experience, and you come back, you'll understand. Or if you just simply die, you're going to understand. Anyway, drop a comment. Any questions? Any thoughts? Thanks for hanging out. Hit that subscribe button. I'll see you in the next one. Taste and see that the Lord is good.